from the nostalgic studios of Univest at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. It is time for a reminiscent episode of Chemical Free Horticultural Hijinks. You bet your garden. Yikes, New Year's Eve is right around the corner, and many of us are desperately trying to remember the words to old Ang Syne. I'm Mike McGrath, and on today's very special show, we'll celebrate the season of calendar replacement by taking a look back at our favorite phone calls from 2023, a festive question of the week about ticks, and much more. So stay right where you are, cats and kittens, because it's all coming up faster than you trying to stay awake until midnight on the 31st right after this. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Hello and welcome to a very special year in review episode of You Bet Your Garden. From the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, I'm your host, Mike McGrath. It took a long time to listen to the last year's worth of shows, but we survived and cherry-picked some great phone calls, special features, and a very festive question of the week. So let's get started with a fabulous phone call from January 7th. 888-492-9444. Lee, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Oh, thank you. It's great to be talking with you. It's great to be talking with you, Lee. (laughs) What they don't know outside of behind the scenes is that it took us a while to hook this call up. But we're glad to have you on. Thank you for your patience. And how you doing? I'm doing fine. I just have a question or a worry that I hope that you can help me feel better about. Um, we've had a very uh, rough winter here in Tennessee. What part of Tennessee, may I ask? Um, Middle Tennessee. We call our town Mount Juliet, a suburb of Nashville. Oh, okay. Very good. Uh, Nashville is... A great responsive town for us. We love it. Um, So what's going on? Well, about three weeks ago, we had a snow uh, that was preceded by a freezing rain. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've lost a lot of ornamental shrubs, I believe. By now, the leaves are falling off. Burford Holly, I think it is, and even some of our Manhattan uh, shrubs ornamental in our area and in our home yard. And I was wondering if you could give me any peace of mind, will those come back? Well, you know, with all of these kind of questions, nobody knows the answer till spring arrives. Um, All of those plants have the capability of growing or putting on new growth. Um, They may need a year to kind of stumble around in the dark and recover, but there's no reason to believe that they are really most sincerely dead. Um, What is happening with your weather now? It's actually warmer than usual. That's not, uh, well, that's not unusual in Tennessee, but we're maybe in the 50 to 60 degree range for several days. And then from history, it may snow again in the next week or two. Right. Um, And you said you had an ice storm followed by snow. Correct. Not a deep snow, but an ice storm. Yes, that's right. Ice is the worst. Ice can severely damaged plants just by the by the weight the sheer weight of the ice on the plants you know heck it collapses roofs so um how how has the rain been um this winter well pretty good this winter i looked to see if we were considered to have a drought during the summer it we went for weeks without rain and uh, July, August, and September. But then when I looked at the records, it didn't consider it a drought. I was worried maybe that was part of the hardship 
and then the ice came. Well, uh, you're kind of right. If uh, weather like that is predicted and it has been very dry lately, it it may be counterintuitive, but it's a good idea to water your plants at the base before the weather event hits. Um, Plants Mm -hmm. that are well hydrated are less likely to suffer tip burn and other things from cold winds. And it's a sin you didn't get a lot of snow because snow protects plants better than any kind of mulch. So there's, you know, there's nothing, and we're hearing about this um, a lot from Tennessee, but a lot from other places as well. Anytime you get really cold and windy conditions and the plants are already a little dry, it really stresses them. But the most important thing you can do now is nothing. Don't look at them. Don't (laughs) think about them. Uh, Pick a good streaming service and binge on like eight different shows. And in the spring, you should hopefully see signs of life. If you do, don't clean them up. Don't prune anything off. Wait till everything has shown you what it's going to do. Let's say we're in May now. And at that point, it would be safe to remove totally dead branches. Um, but other than that, it's it's in the hands of God, my child. I was afraid of that. It's pretty massive. You can almost go anywhere and see it on shrubs around our area. And... Um, we will step away and yes. not, not intervene and give it time. And the impulse, the gardener's impulse is to always help. And that's always the wrong thing to do. Let nature handle this. She has been through this before. And the fact that it's afflicted so many of your neighbors, you can't take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> but be patient wait to see how they um, leaf out in the spring. And if you're uncertain about something, if some plants leaf out and some plants don't, again, I would urge you to be patient. And if a plant is really truly dead, wait till the fall to replace it. Because there's going to be a big run on shrubs in the spring in your area. And by fall, they will have restocked And the prices will be lower, and it's a great time to plant new trees and shrubs. In the meantime, just throw a shroud over them and pretend it's Lent, you know. Well, I appreciate that. Well, I'm I'm sorry for your troubles. It's nothing you did, and I wish you luck, and um, take care of yourself. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It gives me peace of mind just to not intervene and step away, and we'll try that and see what comes of it. Very good. You'll do better than your neighbors who hop in there with fertilizer and pruners. All right, you you. take care, and bye-bye for now. Thank you. And now, let's travel back in time for one of our favorite installments of In the News. As promised, we are introducing a new feature for our longer show edition in the podcast and radio show format. Um, It is news you can use newspaper articles that I think are really relevant to what we're doing here. The first one is a pickup from the New York Times that was featured in my local newspaper. A life now thrives in famous Parisian cemetery. So the cemetery, and please forgive me if I don't do this correctly, Père Lachaise, is nestled between traffic-laden avenues in eastern Paris. It has long been known as the final resting place for celebrated artists, including Jim Morrison, 
Oscar Wilde, and who else we got here? Proust, Chopin, and Sarah Bernhardt. The old one, not the new one. Um, for many years of uh, this famous cemetery, there was a need, a perceived need, to keep it neat and clean. So herbicides were used by the gallon. And as a result, there was no life in the cemetery. <laughs> not, not that you'd expect there to be a lot, but come on, you want to see a bug or two. Um, the greening, well, the caretaker first starts by saying, nature's taking back its rights after Paris decided uh, to first step down and then end herbicide use as a blow against climate change and global warming. The greening of the Acropolis stems from a decades-old plan to phase out herbicides and turn the cemetery into one of Paris's green lungs as the dense capital is designing its urban landscape to make it more climate friendly in the face of rising temperatures. We made a complete turnaround, says the caretaker, with overuse of herbicides being followed by no herbicide use at all. Now, this was fascinating to me. Some 1.3 million individuals are interned there, a figure equal to about half of Paris's living population. So that's kind of weird. Anyway, in the old days, the smallest dandelion had to be eliminated. But that approach started to change in 2011 when the city's municipal government encouraged Paris's cemeteries to phase out herbicides out of environmental concerns. Caretakers were originally very hostile to the initiative, but then they started to see flowers bloom and birds return. By 2015, a full ban on herbicides was in force, and the result was a rich ecosystem that developed as a result. The kidney-shaped leaves of cyclamen flowers, white, pink, and lavender, have popped up between the raised crypts. Whole choirs of birds, including robins and flycatchers, have settled in the cemetery's vast canopy. This was a treat for everybody, but it really reached its peak of importance when coronavirus hit. In April 2020, in a ghostly Paris under lockdown, the caretaker came across a pair of foxes and their four cubs in the cemetery, a rare sighting anywhere in the city limits. Um, since then, it's only gotten better. It is now an ecological wonder that only five years ago was barren. And other cemeteries, not only in France, but also in neighboring countries, are adopting this attitude. So it is, a, a, to me, it's a giant step forward and real good news at a time when we could use some. Well, once again, it is time for our special segment in the news where I find an interesting newspaper article and convey the information to you. The headline on this one, Can Dogs Combat the Spotted Lanternfly? It ran in my local newspaper, The Morning Call, on April 15th. It's written by Paul Avigna, who works for Penn Alive. Uh, dot com. And it is, it's just marvelous. Um, there is a project that's unofficially called the Canine Citizen Science Study, which began two years ago at a lab at Texas Tech and has recently expanded to the East Coast. 
where they are working with dog owners to encourage their canines to sniff out spotted lanternfly egg masses before they can hatch. This is a real serious problem in Pennsylvania. These people, these people, these pests may not have gotten to your region yet, but they are death to grapevines. And it was the local wine industry that is actively seeking this solution. Our story, Paul writes, follows Flint, an eight-year-old border collie. Previously trained as a cadaver dog, he is now sniffing out the egg masses that lantern flies lay in the fall and that hatch in the spring. Pennsylvanians were the first to become acquainted with these invasive insects, which were discovered in Berks County back in 2014. Several vineyards were wiped out by spotted lanternfly, which also can harm trees, crops, and many other types of plants. And dogs, of course, have been used to detect missing people, narcotics, explosives, all the time making use of their, wait for it, 300 million smell receptors. (laughs) Dogs have good sniffers. Flint was recently let loose at the Alson H. Smith Jr. Agricultural Research and Extension Center in Winchester, Virginia. And he did a great job. He even pointed with his paw when he hit pay dirt, realizing, of course, that he got a treat every time he did it right. In conclusion... It is, quote, a great opportunity for people to have fun with their dogs while also contributing back to their communities in a meaningful way. So keep an eye out for this, especially if you're in a lanternfly infested area. They are really damaging uh, to vineyards and dogs, you know, they want to work. They love doing this kind of thing and getting rewarded and congratulated. So be on the lookout uh, for the possibility of training classes in your area or talk to your vet or your local extension service about it. This is from the Allentown Morning Call, Sunday, May 14th, under regional news from the Associated Press. Tiny bats provide hope against fungus deadly to species. Now, we all know about white nose syndrome, a nasty fungus that causes hibernating bats to wake up um, well before their time. And they come out and it's too cold and there's no bugs to eat and they die off. This has caused losses of over 90 percent of hibernating bat colonies across the country and perhaps even the world. But as nature would have it, um, nature finds a way. And we're now seeing some bats that survive the fungus, finish their hibernation, and come out when um, the bugs are flying. So this is from Dorset, Vermont, quote, deep in a cool, damp cave, tens of thousands of furry chocolate brown creatures stir. The tiny brown bats are survivors of a deadly fungus that decimated their population. Going into hibernation last fall, now in early May, they're waking, detaching from their rock wall roosts and making their first tentative flights in search of the moths, beetles, and other flying insects they devour. This is great news. This is adaption. This is Darwin on a stick. Uh, Their health hints that at least some species are adapting to the fungus that has killed millions of their brethren across North America. That's really significant 
because it seems to be creating a stronghold where these bats are mostly surviving and then spreading out throughout New England in the summer, said Alyssa Bennett, a small mammal biologist for the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife. We're hoping that it's a source population for them to recover. Um, The decimation that has occurred has been close to unbelievable. Um, Scientists now estimate that between 70,000 and 90,000 bats hibernate in the Dorset Cave, the largest concentration in New England. But those numbers have dwindled from an estimated winter population of 300,000 to 350,000 or more in the 1960s before white nose disease or white nose fungus um, was first observed. And it matters. First of all, I love being out on a summer evening and seeing my little brown bats fly uh, across my garden. But I remember growing up in a row home in Philadelphia, and every time it got dark, Hundreds of bats would fly out. These are row homes. Um, But we also had streetlights that attracted a lot of moths and stuff. So they eat so many pest insects. The U.S. Geological Survey estimates that bats boost U.S. agriculture by $3.7 billion a year by eating crop-destroying insects, such as larva-laying moths, whose offspring decimate many plants. So there's something special about these bats, Bennett said of Dorset's Little Browns. We can't tell exactly what it is, but we know that something is allowing them to tolerate the disease and pass those features on to their young. So file this under good news, cats and kittens, Uh, bats are our friends. Just don't let them get caught in your hair. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and remind all of you that you're listening to the 2023 You Bet Your Garden Year in Review, in which we recall our favorite phone calls and features from the previous year. So stay right where you are, cats and kittens, because we'll be right back with a moving discussion about memorial gardens and much more. I'm Mike McGrath, and you're listening to a special year-in-review episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome back to the 2023 You Bet Your Garden Year in Review Special featuring our favorite phone calls and features from this previous year. Next up, a phone call that was a favorite of the You Bet Your Garden crew, and I hope a fave of yours as well. Lisette, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you, Lisette. I'm going to step out of our normal uh, way of doing this and say uh, we're very happy you could carve out some time to speak with us. You're a special ed teacher in Muncie? A special education teaching assistant in Muncie, yes. And um, I guess right now is school time, so <laughs> we're going to like go ahead and make this work. Yes, we are. So Muncie, Muncie Indiana is in East Central Indiana, um, so about, a mile, about an hour you know, north, east a bit of Indianapolis, which is smack dab in the middle of the state. And you're pushing it up towards the Great Lakes. We, yeah, I mean, yes, that's still, you know, a couple, you know, two, three hours away from where I live. But, yeah. 
but I read your email because we thought we mm-hmm. weren't going to be able to speak with you. And I was going to make a question of the week. And um, you said you're originally from Georgia? That is correct. I'm originally from Georgia. I was born in Warner Robins, and my daddy, he was from Macon, and my mother was from Albany, which is more the southwest part of the state. And another one of these cities in the wrong state. Albany's in New York. you know. Right. But in Georgia, we say Albany. Oh, there you go. <laughs> ah. And this call is about your dad. Pretty much, yes. My father um, passed away um, this past August, and I received a gift card to one of our local greenhouses and um, in order to plant something in his memory and my mother's memory, too. My mother passed away a number of years ago. And I was hoping to bring a little bit of Georgia up here to Indiana. And I know that, like, they grow peach trees in Michigan, but... Um, and I, but I was wondering if like the climate is here is okay. Like uh, I have a many different questions, like dwarf peach trees, is that better, better than regular? Is that even possible to do here? If so, how do I go about doing it? You, you know, have a single handedly <laughs> picked the most treacherous tree that okay. <laughs> I could envision. First of all, okay. to paraphrase Dorothy Gale, you're not in Georgia anymore, girl. No, sir. (laughs) No, Um, sir. (laughs) Peach trees and apple trees are some of the most difficult plants to cultivate east of the Rockies. And you don't, you know, we've said this many times on the show. If you're planting something in memoriam, you don't want it to die right away. That's not going to make you feel better about things. Right. So I think you got to get Georgia off your mind and (laughs) you have to think about something that essentially is very easy to grow, not prone Mm -hmm. to disease or pests Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and ideally is bulletproof. Now, what did your parents like besides peaches? (laughs) Well, I said pecans. Fig trees, we had those. We ha- um, azaleas. I have two of those already. Um, those kind of things. <laughs> That's well, the best I can think of as far as the shrubs and the trees. Yeah, except for the azaleas, you're you're really uh, you're really batting low. Let's put it that way. Okay. Right. right. Yeah. Well, what would you suggest as something that's you know really you know beautiful and would grow well here that's something that would you know be appropriate for this when we're talking about plants that are in memoriam i always Mm -hmm. think of something that blooms in the spring okay because that is the reminder of eternal life correct after the winter and you 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 got a pretty good winter where you are so Yes. yes yes we do so my first thought was a flowering cherry tree Okay. Like they have um, along the Potomac in Washington, D.C. Right, Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. Okay. They're long-lived. They're easy to care for. They put Mm -hmm. on a remarkable display in the spring. And then unlike flowering apple trees, they don't turn ugly. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. They, they're not exactly a four-season tree, but you won't mind looking at it. Understood. So. Okay. Are they coming, do they come in like dwarf varieties as well? Yeah. I, was, I didn't want something too huge. Flowering cherries, to the best of my knowledge, are either naturally dwarf in size mm-hmm. or the ones most available have been dwarfed. Because if you go down to the Potomac, I mean, they top out at, like, eight feet tall. Okay. Okay. And did you have any instructions for, like, exactly how to plant it or what to, you know, plant it with? Or you know, should I get that from the nursery? Oh, God, no. Um, <laughs> years and years ago, I would tell people to invest in professional planting and have the nursery install it. But what I've been seeing lately is not professional planting. It's smash and grab. Uh, They don't prepare the tree. They drop it into the ground. They cover it with the wrong kind of mulch, and then they move on. 
I've seen guys with giant augers dropping trees that are still inside their wrappings into the ground, shoveling soil back in and then moving on and doing an entire hillside in two hours. Wow. Because, you know, time is money and it's all about the Benjamins, baby. (laughs) I guess you're right. But but for me, in this case, it's not. So I want to take my time and do it right. One of the big advantages you have now is nurseries um, almost always have leftover stock. Mm -hmm. So, and you have a gift certificate for a specific nursery. So if you like the idea of a flowering cherry, um, Mm -hmm. see what they have available. It will be heavily discounted because they don't want to overwinter it. And oh, okay. I was not, I was expecting to actually plant in the spring, but you're saying I could plant it now. I did not know yes. that. Yes. Uh, actually, the survival rate for uh, trees and shrubs planted in the fall is much better than in the spring. Oh, okay. Good especially lately, spring turns to a really hot summer very quickly, and that mm-hmm. stresses the tree, whereby if you, okay. if you plant the tree, quote, now— It'll have time to establish a root system. It'll go naturally dormant. It will wake wake up naturally. Mm -hmm. And again, if we're talking about a spring blooming tree, you're really going to screw it up by planting it when it's in bud or in Uh, flower. I I guess you're right. I hadn't thought thought that far ahead. Yep, you are are correct. (laughs) So um, you can get many more details at the website if you look on our website archive of frequently asked questions, go to tree planting, but the basics, and you can do this, you Mm -hmm. dig a hole that's wide, but not Mm -hmm. deep. You you want the root flare, the very top of the root system to be at ground level or slightly above ground level. If you, okay. if when you're trying to figure it out, you drop the tree into the hole and it's a popsicle, fill the hole back up with more soil. Gotcha. It's counterintuitive, but planting high makes for a much happier tree. Okay. Remove all wrappings, everything, no matter what anybody else tells you. Burlap okay. does not disintegrate underground because now okay. it's in an anaerobic system. It's just going right. to it's just going to strangle the roots of the tree. So correct because there's no oxygen getting down there. Yeah, right. Gotcha. And the roots need oxygen. Right. So you want to remove any kind of metal cage, cut off the um, cut off the burlap, position the mm-hmm. tree high, um, fill the hole back up with the soil you removed. Okay. Um, nothing else, and then. All right. No wood mulch. What you okay. what you want is an inch or two of high quality compost, beginning about mm-hmm. six inches from the trunk and going out into a nice circle. Then, about six inches, you said. Okay, six inches from the trunk, but go out a couple of feet. Gotcha. Because that's where the but roots... don't let the mulch actually touch the trunk. You don't want the mulch to touch the trunk. Right? Never let mulch touch any plant. Right. Mulch okay. Is, gotcha. Mulch <laughs> is to keep the roots from cooking and to prevent weed gotcha. growth. There are no roots directly under the trunk. The roots are spread out as far as the canopy will be when it's full grown. Exactly, right. That's that's okay. where they're going to benefit, and the compost is the only feeding you'll need. Then, okay. Then take a hose and let it drip slowly um, okay. for several hours, six to eight hours the first time. And then okay. e- even though we'll be going into winter, if we okay. get a week without rain, water the tree. The okay. fir- and then especially if we get into the spring and the weather warms up and we don't get rain, do the same mm-hmm. thing. Long, slow watering for hours okay. once gotcha. a week. The first year is the most important okay. year. Okay. Now, I Should also- I move the hose around to, like, different parts, you sure. know, where I'm watering it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
And now I, I also have to do my bailout. If okay, you, if you don't think you're going to have the time to simply pay attention, I urge people to think about doing some sort of statuary or ornamentation that would have a memory to them of the okay. deceased. For instance, okay. this isn't the way it worked, but I was at my local garden center a couple of years ago, and they had this beautiful archway, metal archway between departments. Oh, it, yeah. It, it was tall, and it had um, a dragonflies and <laughs> cattails on the outside, and it was just beautiful. And I bought it. It, it wasn't theoretically for sale. I said, boy, I wish it was. And they said, well, that's why we originally bought it. <laughs> and so they sold it to me. And that's the entrance to my garden now. Oh, that's a beautiful idea. And it works fabulously. It's not going to die. Right. <laughs> um, and think of you passing back into that life in Georgia Every time you go through the archway, think of that as being <laughs> the tunnel to yeah. those memories. That's, yeah, that's a beautiful idea. And then I could even, like, maybe find some clematis to go up and around it or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. But the arch would be the thing. Right. Okay. Well, that sounds just like a fantastic idea. I, my My daddy and my mother were the ones that got me into the love of gardening. And, um... They're the, they're the, and I'm passing that on to my daughters as well. And it's just something that we just absolutely love to do. And I'm, I wanted to remember him this way <laughs> because he was always, you know, when we were kids, we didn't want to do it. You know, go out and weed the garden. I don't want to. <laughs> but, but then as we grow up, we grew up, we really began to appreciate, and, you know, what a beautiful thing it is to have a garden. And so. something like this would have four season interest. It wouldn't Correct. be just yeah, a, a springtime burst that you're praying Correct. that it doesn't rain so you see the flowers long. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so, you know, okay. those are my two big pieces of advice. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, I did have one more just really quick question. Do you ever deal with people that have put, um, that black plastic on their garden? Have you ever seen you know, uh, how many people use that yeah, it's unnecessary. We don't need any more okay. plastic in the world. The and world. it shreds. Okay. <laughs> it shreds. It gets mixed into the soil. Oh, and it deteriorates. Yeah. And, yeah. and okay. it creates mold underneath. Okay. Soil is supposed well, that, to breathe. Yeah, that makes sense. So, okay, because I'm, I'm up for my neighbor. So, all right. Well, I appreciate all your help and thank you so much. And we, um, I really appreciate your show. And you taking the time to speak with me about this and helping me to remember my father. It's been a real pleasure. And thank you for the work you do. It's very important. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And you take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Two little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs. Two little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs. Two little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs, little bugs. Little bugs, little bugs. Little bug, 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 little bug. Heads up, podcast and radio listeners. It is time for our audio segment, just for yous, in the news. And this time out, the news is pretty disturbing. In the February 20th issue of The New Yorker, Adam Gopnik reviews a book 
and almost writes a book about the book. Uh, the title of his article is Artificial Light Poisoning the Planet. A Swedish ecologist argues that its ubiquity is wrecking our habitats and our health. Now, this is, uh, I'm not sure what the answer to this is, but it lends a lot of credence to people who are fighting uh, to keep unlit areas unlit. So, among the many looming ecological disasters that terrify us today, one that only a handful of people have contemplated is sufficiently looming and terrifying is the loss of bats in our belfries. According to the Darkness Manifesto, that's the book, by the Swedish ecologist, and I pray I'm getting this close to right, Johan Ekloff, most churches in southwest Sweden had bat colonies back in the 1980s, and now most of them don't. Light pollution, his research suggests, has been a major culprit. District after district has installed modern floodlights to show off the architecture it's proud of, while the animals, who have for centuries found safety in the darkness of the church towers, are slowly vanishing from these places. Adam explains that the book is written as a sort of silent spring manifesto against the ecological devastations of light pollution. Um, Although the catalog of catastrophe is real, writes Adam, what one most remembers are the beasts in his bestiary. We learn, for instance, of the ghost moth, a species in which the adult males appear in fields in twilight. But these creatures are threatened by the confusing presence of artificial light. And moths, he points out, play a critical role as pollinators. So, again, this is just a, a t <laughs> almost like a court case against bright light. The spectral ghost moths only come out after the sun sets. And that's when the adult female comes out of her chrysalis looking for a mate. But light ruins the romance. The female admits fewer fur. <clears throat> but light ruins the romance. The female emits fewer pheromones in the presence of artificial light, and the composition of her scent is completely different from that emitted in darkness. So mating never gets started. The females wait in vain. Oh. And again, continuing, some of this is from Adam's review and some of it is from the book itself. Since the invention of the light bulb, streetlights and floodlights have come ominously to disturb age-old circadian rhythms. Artificial light, the polluted light, causes birds to sing in the middle of the night, sends turtle babies in the wrong direction, <laughs> and prevents the mating rituals of coral in reefs which take place under the light of the moon. Now, this goes on forever, but we don't have forever, so I'm going to end with a, a, just a startling revelation. It turns out that the strongest source of illumination on Earth is not some helpful lighthouse, but the sky beam atop the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas creating a blinding 42 billion candle power of light every night, meant merely as a come on to tourists and gamblers, it unintentionally excites and undoes flocks of birds, genetically programmed by evolution to fly towards bright light. And in 2019, it attracted clouds of grasshoppers, who flew towards the Suedo Egyptian pyramid with all the horror of a Suedo Egyptian plague. Every evening, Nevada's meteorologists could see the swarms approaching Las Vegas on their radar screens. Whoever would have imagined that reconstructing an Egyptian tomb 
and sending a piercing pillar of light to it from the heavens would reawaken an ancient curse. Uh, that is, aside from every screenwriter in Hollywood. Uh, the black comedy of this effect is not lost on the author of the book, but he sees it as something less than entertaining. In recent decades, he tells us, the biomass of all flying insect species has, by some measures, collapsed by close to 75%. So, turn out your lights. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and remind all of you that you're listening to the 2023 You Bet Your Garden Year in Review, featuring our favorite phone calls and features from the previous year. So stay right where you are, cats and kittens, because we'll be right back with a festive discussion of ticks. I'm Mike McGrath, and you are listening to a special year in review episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. This is 91.3 FM, WLVR Bethlehem, WLVR.org. Welcome back to the 2023 You Bet Your Garden Year in Review special, featuring our favorite phone calls and features from this past year. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, and we're in the stretch now, cats and kittens. In this segment, you'll hear an important phone call from January 7th, an inspiring question of the week about ticks, and maybe even another segment of In the News. Our esteemed audio editor, Jonas Bowen, is still trying to figure out where to fit all this stuff. So I won't know until you do. But enough with the suspense. Let's get back to the memory. 888-492-9444. Lee, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Oh, thank you. It's great to be talking with you. It's great to be talking with you, Lee. <laughs> what they don't know outside of behind the scenes is that it took us a while to hook this call up. But we're glad to have you on. Thank you for your patience. And how you doing? I'm doing fine. I just have a question or a worry that I hope that you can help me feel better about. Um, we've had a very uh, rough winter here in Tennessee. What part of Tennessee, may I ask? Um, Middle Tennessee. We call our town Mount Juliet, a suburb of Nashville. Oh, okay. Very good. Uh, Nashville is... A great responsive town for us. We love it. Um, so what's going on? Well, about three weeks ago, we had a snow uh, that was preceded by a freezing rain. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've lost a lot of ornamental shrubs, I believe. By now, the leaves are falling off. Burford Holly, I think it is, and even some of our Manhattan uh, shrubs ornamental in our area and in our home yard. And I was wondering if you could give me any peace of mind, will those come back? Well, you know, with all of these kind of questions, nobody knows the answer till spring arrives. Um, all of those plants have the capability of growing or putting on new growth. Um, they may need a year to kind of stumble around in the dark and recover, but there's no reason to believe that they are really most sincerely dead. Um, what is happening with your weather now? It's actually warmer than usual. That's not, uh, well, that's not unusual in Tennessee, but we're maybe in the 50 to 60 degree range for several days. And then from history, it may snow again in the next week or two. Right. Um, and you said you had an ice storm followed by snow. Correct. Mm -hmm. Not a deep snow, but an ice storm. Yes, that's yeah, right. Ice is the worst. Ice can severely damaged plants just by the by the weight, the sheer weight of the ice on the plants. You know, heck, it collapses roofs. So um, how, how has the rain been um, this winter? Well, pretty good this winter. 
I looked to see if we were considered to have a drought during the summer. It, we went for weeks without rain in uh, July, August, and September. But then when I looked at the records, it didn't consider it a drought. I was worried maybe that was part of the hardship, and then the ice came. Well, uh, you're kind of right. If uh, weather like that is predicted and it has been very dry lately, it may, it may be counterintuitive, but it's a good idea to water your plants at the base before the weather event hits. Um, plants that are well hydrated are less likely to suffer tip burn and other things from cold winds. And it's a sin you didn't get a lot of snow, because snow protects plants better than any kind of mulch. So there's, you know, there's nothing, and we're hearing about this um, a lot from Tennessee, but a lot from other places as well. Anytime you get really cold and windy conditions and the plants are already a little dry, it really stresses them. But the most important thing you can do now is nothing. Don't look at them. Don't think <laughs> about them. Uh, pick a good streaming service and binge on like eight different shows. And in the spring, you should hopefully see signs of life. If you do, don't clean them up. Don't prune anything off. Wait till everything has shown you what it's going to do. Let's say we're in May now. And at that point, it would be safe to remove totally dead branches. Um, but other than that, it's it's in the hands of God, my child. I was afraid of that. It's pretty massive. You can almost go anywhere and see it on shrubs around our area. And um, I, we will see. Step away, and yes. not, not intervene and give it time. It's the impulse, be hard. the gardener's impulse is to always help. And that's always the wrong thing to do. Let nature handle this. She has been through this before. And the fact that it's afflicted so many of your neighbors, you can't take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> but be patient. Wait to see how they um, leaf out in the spring, and if you're uncertain about something, if some plants leaf out and some plants don't, again, I would urge you to be patient, and if a plant is really truly dead, wait till the fall to replace it, because there's going to be a big run on shrubs in the spring in your area, and by fall, they will have restocked, and the prices will be lower, and it's a great time to plant new trees and shrubs. In the meantime, just throw a shroud over them and pretend it's Lent, you know. Well, I appreciate that. Well, I'm, I'm sorry for your troubles. It's nothing you did, and I wish you luck, and um, take care of yourself. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. It gives me peace of mind just to not intervene and step away, and we'll try that and see what comes of it. Very good. You'll do better than your neighbors who hop in there with fertilizer and pruners. All right, you, you take care, and bye-bye for now. As promised, it is time for the question of the week, and a very timely question it is. We're calling it How to Outwit Terrible Ticks. Slater in Williamsport, PA, which he describes as being on the fringes of reception from Penn State's fabulous WPSU, writes, In the past, you have discussed permethrin-treated clothing as an effective means of avoiding ticks and the diseases they carry. It certainly works for me. I no longer get ticked. You are a strong promoter of organic methods, and yet your care for people has kept you from being a blind ideologue when it comes to dangerous ticks. My respect for you has only increased. The weather is now warming up. Perhaps it's time for a reminder to your listeners. P.S. 
As bad as Lyme disease is, some of the pathogens they carry are even worse. My buddy almost died from a different tick-borne disease right here in central PA. Well, you are correct, Slater. One of my favorite people, Marty Singleton, who was co-chair of the security committee at the Philadelphia Folk Festival, contracted Rocky Mountain spotted fever while out target shooting one day. This once giant and gentle bear of a man became unrecognizable during his months-long hospital stay, never recovered, and died of the disease. The CDC has identified eight different specific pathogens and diseases spread by ticks, with Rocky Mountain spotted fever considered the deadliest and Lyme disease the best known. Now, I have held bees that have stingers in my bare hands. I have picked up a large snapping turtle by its tail, which makes them go into play dead possum mode, hopefully. And I view spiders and snakes as my beloved garden protectors. Yeah, turtles too, but who doesn't like turtles? And yet a photo or a video of a tick always sends me right into squirmy mode. If they serve a purpose in our ecosystem, we still have one of those, right? I'll be darned if I can figure out what it is. Mosquitoes keep many species of songbirds and dragonflies well fed. But ticks? Come on. Damn you for being thorough, Noah. Anyway, Slater is also correct that permethrin is the number one answer. DEET and many non-chemical botanical alternatives are effective against mosquitoes if you cover every exposed area of your body. But DEET is absorbed through your skin and exits your body via your liver and kidneys, perhaps making it the next draft choice for the Roundup Award of, but you told us it was safe. DEET also has no effect on ticks and may actually attract them. Permethrin is a synthetic form of the botanical insecticide pyrethrum, which is made from the dried flowers of a certain species of daisy. The natural form works well, but degrades quickly. The synthetic form is designed to remain active despite exposure to air and sunlight and is deadly to ticks in a manner that no other compound can approach. Virtually all studies agree that ticks cannot survive on permethrin-treated clothing for more than a few minutes. More intriguing studies suggest that the little bloodsuckers might begin to die when they're less than a foot away. And yes, I said clothing. Permethrin is meant to be applied to your clothes. You should not apply it directly to your skin, not because it will harm you in any way, but because your body temperature would aerosolize it away. The air between you and your clothes helps prevent this. There are a few 100% in gardening, but I have never been bitten while wearing my protective pants, socks, and hat. Brr, yes, they can drop down on top of you from trees. But I have been bitten when I was lazy and didn't wear my tick-proof clothes. Many people spray a set or two of their own clothes monthly. These sprays are available at any store with a camping or hunting section and, of course, online. You hang the clothes outdoors, spray all sides thoroughly, and let the laundry dry for several hours before wearing. Be sure to purchase sprays that contain only permethrin. DEET is useless against ticks. Ah, but permethrin does repel mosquitoes as well. In an abundance of caution, I recommend you have a fan blowing the mist away from you while you're spraying and keep cats out of the area as they are very sensitive to permethrin. You can also buy clothing that has been professionally treated 
from several sources, including L.L. Bean and a company known as Insect Shield. The repellency factor of pre-treated clothes lasts much longer than clothes you treat yourself. Insect Shield, for instance, claims its treatments will outlast 100 washings. You can also send some companies your own clothes to be professionally treated. Hey, and I want to thank Slater for his compliment. It was a difficult decision for me to recommend permethrin, as it is not organic. But he's right. I made that choice because I recognize the dangers that ticks present. Also, the material doesn't enter the environment. It stays on your clothes and doesn't get into our food, bodies, or soils. This is what the great Bill Quarles, Ph.D., calls common sense pest control, in which you use the safest materials possible. Thanks again, Slater. Of course, there are other preventions you can employ. Chickens, ducks, geese, and especially guinea hens are alpha predators of ticks. Controlling mice on your property can greatly reduce the number of ticks. And be sure to keep any tall grassy areas in your landscape as neat as possible. Ticks love the moist cover they provide. So don't you go strolling through that meadow of yours without protection. Well, that sure was a hopefully helpful look back at some of the past year's favorite phone calls and features. Now, wasn't it? Yikes. My producer is threatening to mess with my memories. If I don't get out of this studio, we must be out of time. (laughs) And she's way late on the memory thing. That ship sailed long ago. But you can still call us anytime at 888-492-9444 or send us your email, your tired, your poor, your wretched refuse teeming towards our garden shore at ybyg at wlvt.org. Please tell us your location. At the time of this taping, we're not sure exactly where the question of the week will appear in print. It may be at the Gardens Alive website. It may be at the Gurneys, that's G-U-R-N-E-Y-S website which is a subsidiary of Gardens Alive. Check the You Bet Your Garden Facebook page for the latest up-to-date guesses, rumors, and suspicious information. You'll find all of our contact information, plus answers to your garden questions, audio of this show, audio and video of previous shows, and links to our internationally renowned podcast. It's all at our website, YouBetYourGarden.org. You Bet Your Garden is an hour-long public radio show and podcast produced and delivered to you every week from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Our radio show is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange. You Bet Your Garden was created by Mike McGrath. Mike McGrath was created when lightning struck him while he was standing in a kiddie pool and trying to pat his head and rub his tummy at the same time. Ken Queter plays our theme song. Our chief content officer is Yoni Greenbaum. Our angel of the airways is Christine Dempsey. Our engineer is cheerful Charlie Sarah. Our social media director is Amanda Norfleet. Check out her fine work and play Where's the Question of the Week at the You Bet Your Garden Facebook page. Our peerless princess of profound production is Jasmine Griffin. Special thanks to our fearless audio editor, the lovely Jonas Bowen, who assembled this jigsaw puzzle of a show. 
He is currently recovering in hospital. Zach the Tack Wisniewski and Ducky the Dancing Duck are running around the station yelling, Good riddance to last year. To which our CEO Tim Fallon adds, Humbug! Humbug, I say. I'm your humbug host, Mike McGrath, wishing you a happy, healthy, and better new year from all of us at You Bet Your Garden. And then we'll see you again next year.